Hello, Gary. Hey, Guy, how are you? I'm very well. I'm really looking forward to today. Yes, a blur man. A blur, it's all a blur. More than blur, obviously. So much, no, so much more than the blur. This is a guy who's, um, he's got a vast catalogue of solo stuff and art and now soundtracks. It's- yeah, and he's just done a, a, a graphic novel or he's, he's sort of commissioned a graphic novel that he's done... He's done an album to go with, and yeah. each track is a different story. And it's very different to anything I've ever heard him do before. It's much more electronic and uh, funky. Yeah. But also, guys, just start, he's been playing recently with, with a, a band that I've kind of heard of. Oh, yeah. No, I'm going to try. Obviously, I'm going to try and start a fight here. Right. Duran Duran, he's played. He's been. Oh, he's on the new Duran Duran album. <laughs> Graham Coxon. Who would have thought that? I could. You could make that up, could you? You couldn't. You. You wouldn't write it. It's too far fetched. Let's but get him he's on. V- he's very good at it. Welcome to the Rock on Tours. Okay, guys, I'm ready. This was great, guys. I, I, it's so great to talk to two guys that have done this. Well, it's a big tune for sure. I actually wrote that originally for Tina Turner. Of course, I had gone and found Joni Mitchell down in Florida and brought her back. You know, what people forget about Bowie is that he was such a kind man. I've listened to a few of them and they've been really good, man. I'm sitting in the back of the car coming into London, they're brilliant. I know you're musicians, but you've been more professional than a lot of journalists. Remember me? I'm in a band now. <laughs> it's called Roxy Music. You know this thing about the 10,000 hours of experience? Oh, yeah. To, to get good at something. When we recorded Arnold Lane, we'd done about 50 hours. The Rock Hunters podcast with Gary Kemp and Guy Pratt. Where am I there? We can hear you. Yay! Hi. Yay! Watch <laughs> Hello, Graham. Hi, Graham. Hello, all. Thanks for doing this. How are you doing, Glenn? We're good. Am I close enough? This is t- <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm going to set off my. I'm going to record it into um, Logic as well. Ah, uh, a pro, a pro. Wow, well. that's a good idea. That's what we're doing. Is that what you need? An MP3 as well. That'd be fantastic. That'd be great. Hang on, blimey, right? Hang on. Yeah, I'm getting record folder not found. Do you want to get Stephen Street in, Graham? <laughs> Look, I've done all sorts. <laughs> I have the no. Is this a kind of a new territory for you? What? Being a programmer. A, what's a programmer? You know, t- uh, operating logic and stuff. I well, I record stuff. It's not really new territory. Because you did all of uh, Superstate on it, didn't you? Well, basically, I, I did an awful lot of work on that and, 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 and all other stuff. And I've done lots of soundtracks purely on my own. I wonder, I saw a documentary when you're doing... Um... The end of the effing world, yeah, as you as you called it, yeah, which is a great title until you have to say it repeatedly in an interview context. Yeah, I just sort of go, I just sort of say, the end, end of the world, which was fantastic, by the way. And I've got and the the, the the score did absolutely what a score can and should do. It was really nice. It really added. Oh, to thank it. you very much. I mean, we can talk more or less about that as we go along but um yeah i mean it did it it, it taught me a lot doing that because i had to be nine to five pretty much making music it's um i learned a lot about workflow and what to do and 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 how to do things as easy and as easy as possible and as quickly as possible do you enjoy that because the the thing i hate about things like that is it's just the actual mechanics of recording yourself, I find quite tedious. Because you did you did space guy you did space didn't you years ago i did a lot of score back in the day uh, but I had, but I had an assistant. I had Don Beacon assisting me, who's now oh, right. plays keyboards in the source for the sequence. Uh, but yeah, that's the stuff I hate. It's that now my son does my editing for me. Oh, just the editing and things like that. Just that stuff. It's really just when you've got a guitar on your lap and you can't. Kind of, oh, I really like you know, you it. Find... Um, I'm, I mean, that's what I meant about workflow. You know, I just had a sort of a an eighty-seven there, going into a ten seventy-three and um, going into Logic and, you know, I would just go press a button, acoustic guitar, press a button, sing. And then I was kind of using a lot of the Logic drummer and using a lot of the Logic guitar sims and bass sims. And after a bit, I just got very quick quick at doing it. And and, and, so- and playing Cajon. Yeah, I did. You seem pretty, you look pretty tasty There's on that. There's a bit of record. Cajon on that. Yeah. Just, could you you want to just tell the listeners what a cajon it, is? The cajon, I mean, it's a it, thing it's, that they used to sit in and go fishing for salmon, it, isn't it? Well, uh, <laughs> what, what I, the one I heard oh. about, what I found about it in Peru, which it was, it was from when people used to go around to people's houses and jam, and they never have an instrument, so they'd pull the drawers out the chests of drawers. 
and just sit on them. And then you'd tap the various sides of it as a drum. And then it became got to a point where people actually started making Yeah, drums. not surprised without the knob on the top. Yeah, that, exactly. that would be more comfortable. <laughs> I, I have a Victorian ornate handle on mine. And that was much more comfortable. And in a way, that sound that, you know, listen, I know you don't like the term because I, I don't think anyone likes the term lo-fi. But that kind of, the style of music you made for End of the Effing World was just seemed to work so you could imagine that kid that boy and that girl going off and making that music as well it sort of it suited their yeah. personalities so much yeah i think that was my my sort of job i mean that that song I, you're talking about walking all day walking yeah, all yeah, that yeah, song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. i mean that was written and done in half an hour you know really pretty much it was very very quick and i got it together very quick and it and it's not exactly lo-fi. I mean, it's it's pretty ramshackle, but it, it was to a click. Um, it wasn't accurately to a click, but it but it had to have a sort of a woozy, sort of higgity hoggity sort of quality. It's a yeah. kind of a it's a sort of an Essex country blues, really. <laughs> That's what I was trying to get at. <laughs> Deliverance that, that, for Essex. Yeah, because that place they end up, which seemed like out in the Deliver woods, from the shack, it, it all seems so American. It seems so. I mean, but I just, well, there, there, there was a whole brief this. where there's there there is this sort of thing of making um, cinematic sounds, and I, I I like a bit of lap steel, and I like a bit of um, slide. So there was a sort of a Paris Essex, rather than Paris Texas <laughs> thing. Yeah, um, yeah, you know, because there are areas of Essex where you know there's Tip Tree, yeah. There's there's areas of Essex where you know, um, it's countryside. It is it is. Very, very, very rural and um, and 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 different, and and almost hillbillyish. And, and and I don't want to, you know, say anything bad about Tiptree or Coggeshall, but there'll be twelve Range Rovers outside your house if you do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's, there's good jam. Blacked out. But I used to uh, go to the pub and hang out with people from Tiptree, Coggeshall. My sister lived in Tiptree as well. So, how, how did you get offered the job to do the the soundtrack? Did you know the director, or did he just love your style of playing? Um, the director did was was a fan. It was John Entwistle. Who went on to do I'm not okay with this as well. I did music for him on a series called I'm not So I had to do a double take when you said John Entwistle. Yes, yeah, not the bass player. <laughs> no, yeah. <laughs> it's a dead bass player. So, I mean, yeah, not him. Um, a very talented director, English chap from North. And um, he he got in co contact with Matt Biffer, who, who is a music supervisor who I'd worked with on The Riot Club. I made a song. That was my first job to, to write a song oh, right. for the outro of a film called the riot club which was that was a, yeah no, I saw that film. in oxford universities and, and, and things like that so and i thought oh my gosh i better get a logic do i get that and i'll get a little focus right thing because you have a vast back catalogue of solo stuff going back you know so yeah you know, but... well I'd, I'd sort of have to do it i i had a sort of a, a little hard disk recorder thing which i was dreadful on i did have logic years ago but i couldn't get my head around it but but it was a sort of um i just had to do it then it was like well i've got to do it i've got to get mm -hmm. learn about it i've got logic and i just sort of started doing it I, I i wasn't very good at it it was almost like how i used photoshop or how i used painter i never read anything and a lot of the mistakes that i made actually were kind of fortuitous mistakes kind of good mistakes yes uh, ended up in there yeah but don't you always find that but like i because i used to be good on logic like back in the 90s when it came yeah. out and then i just didn't use it for 10 years and you come back and it's just a completely alien landscape yeah. to me now i have no idea it's, and it's, the funny thing is whenever you work with anyone else everyone has a it's like they're using a different program everyone has such completely idiosyncratic ways because no one's read the manual yeah everyone's found that you know let's talk about super state graham because yeah. uh that sounds like nothing else I think you've done. I mean, this is kind of like funkadelic, bit of Bowie, you know, this is, and it's it's all based around this set of stories that you had uh, for for a graphic novel. Did it start as an idea for a graphic novel or for a, for a film? Um, not really. Or originally, another idea that, that somebody had was, was that they were going to write a comedy drama about a band that was going to get back together. And, and it was a band that got big, post-punk and into the mid 80s, got more and more commercial, had their problems, fell apart, and they were going to reform for something. So so there was an idea around a, um, a sort of a comic, I think it was sort of a comedy drama about that and that I was going to write the music 
for, for, for this band. So I kind of started to write songs for an imagined singer, which was kind of interesting because I did that after that. That sort of fell through, but it kind of got me into a sort of a, a kind of an interesting way of working where I just pretend to be somebody somebody else and um, a, a different singer. So I put on a voice, say, I put on a different voice. I would allow myself to sing about subjects I wouldn't ordinarily sing about. So that sort of set me up within Superstate to to write from different perspectives about, about different types of, uh, you, you know, there were different sort of like almost kitchen sink dramas. And then um, they turned into stories and then they sort of turned into 15, 15 different songs then then they turned into stories really so my 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 idea for it to be a sort of a movie or almost like a netflix series or something like that suddenly came about where where there was lots of stories about different um strange stories about with different people different circumstances that they all sort of tended to that they all sort of eventually interlinked and there was an overall weird stuff going on and there was a narrative about right. sort of a, a sort of a narcissistic society driven and you know and the rich and the very poor and and um, angelic visitations and lots of confusion and, and disenchanted kids who were hanging out in the rubbish dump and doing their own thing and and Dystopia is always a great yeah, subject. Robot matter. girlfriends and boyfriends. And... But so are you saying, so the stories came from the songs? It was literally songs first? Yeah. But, I mean, which is like a reverse musical. That's brilliant. Rather than having to, you know. Yeah, it was kind of right. I wrote the soundtrack or to the concept. or um, And then I got together and, and we got together and wrote. I mean, I had each story in mind, but then we had to sort of just create more detail on how they were going to interconnect. But how did you find the artists? Um, well, Z2 Comics in in America um, came up with people that they thought would, would be good for each um, story. And um, I just went through many, many people and picked out. And are you a comic? Are you a comic? I'm not guy? really a comic guy. I do have them. And, and, and I was into things like Akira. Graf graphic novels. Graphic novels. And stuff like that. When, you know, in the late 80s, we watched Akira, that film. So I was into some of the Japanese stuff and the graphic novel. I've got a few stray bullets, but I was never really mega so, dagger into it. Manga. Because it's manga. interesting that just, you know, Duncan Jones has done this big comic project recently. And maybe you should collaborate with him. Think called Maddie. Oh, right. Which I think, uh, yeah, oh. which is the big dystopia. David Bowie's song. Oh, I'll look yeah. out for that. Really, I went into the comic thing because it was going to be too expensive to do a series or a film. I think what's key to it is that this this is a kind of venture into a style of music that I've not heard you do. Who else is singing on it? Because you're not just the only, you're not singing on it just yourself, are you? There's Val and Rahel and then and, and the, the, there's lovely singers who work on the Basement Jacks. So I didn't have any idea. I mean, you know, I left it up to Blue May and that's who I finished it off in a comp that? studio. And um, right. you know, he, he sort of suggested musicians like and things because it was kind of done. I'd sort of done it at home, but I wanted to put real drums on and we got Tom Skinner in to do the real drums or I did some drums on one of them. And then, um, you know, so we just got in the proper instruments and, and a proper bass player. And for some of them, a couple of them just stayed as they were, how I'd done them at home. You know, there's one called Tommy Gun and um, there's another one called um, Ball of Light. Did you get all those other musicians in? Because you wanted it, because the idea was it was meant to be a band, some other band. Because you're fantastically self-sufficient when it comes to making. I'm self-sufficient in all ways, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah no <laughs> the, the thing is, the concept behind it is that there were different types of women voices. There were extremely strong voices, like Mother Universe voices, that were forceful. And then there were other voices that were more gentler, and they all had characters and roles to play. So there, there had to be some um, voices that were more on the angelic side. And some that were like playing a like powerful kind of mother earth type voices and then the, and then i just i mean i i'm a huge fan of of that 70s thing where there's those the the the, the women doing the backing singing yeah, and, yeah you know you know a sort of a a steely dan type thing like you know you know, black cow, you know, where they've got those beautiful black, the, the sort of the, the backing singers there. And um, I, I really loved the whole sound of that. So I was kind of going 
into sonically into this world where yeah it, it was kind of going into disco i was listening to a lot of 70s music every day on the school run and so I, I you know i started writing it when david barry died on that day and there's a song called we remain oh. which is kind of quite bowie-ish or stroke peter hamillish really yeah. but but it was really trying to get into my my love of slime family stone and king crimson at the same time Oh, I like that. Yeah, that's, that's a good That's combination. quite a palette. <laughs> yeah, so it's kind of quite open, but it, but it leaves it open for me to 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 sort of introduce prog soul, yeah, prog disco. Yeah, sort of you know introduce some chaos and going out there in places. It's difficult to find Graham because you didn't you haven't put it out under your own name, and so initially I couldn't find where it was. You know, on my normal yeah. streaming services. Maybe that was a mistake. <laughs> Super State is Graham Cox, which is a shame because it took me a long time to make, and I thought it was a, I thought it was good. I thought it was going into areas where I'd never been, and I think vocally, um, I was kind of getting better, and and, and I think lyrically, it, it it sort of deals with a few things that were difficult for me at the time to 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 sort of deal with because I mean, uh, my whole experiences during the making of that were personally kind of similar to to what i was singing about this mm. society so um it it's it's it it was a it was hard work for me but at the end of 2020 i got i was i was in um north north london thinking right this is just got, i've just got to get this out out of my system because it had been sitting around for three or four years really not sitting so there, is there I've been working on it for that amount of time and it was time for me so is there a sort of catharsis yeah catharsis it was time element. for me to get get it out there you yeah, know one of the most extraordinary things that i read last year was mm. that you were playing with duran duran <laughs> yeah uh, oh man and i've looked at God, some of your telling stuff telling bitchy story here what's bitchy stories <laughs> <laughs> i mean you know i mean spandau v duran duran was oasis <laughs> versus blur yeah, was I mean, it really you know was it but, really like that well uh, yes and no, not really. Probably. Well, it's a bit yes and no. Uh, well, wasn't some, as, some wasn't as well. You have to ask what? who exactly whose opi people's opinions differ on it. No, I mean we were we were we were friends during it, and uh, but obviously there was an element of competition, yeah. and people wanted to do better than each other, and uh, you know there were kids out there that would go, well, I I I'm a Durani or I'm a Spandau fan or whatever, you know, and but secretly bought each other's yeah. records, and if I'm sure the it's the same that with you. Normally cause the trouble. But it's such a different style. I, I to kind of get my head around knowing your style and how it, you know, well, I, I've, you know, listening to you as a guitar player for years and years, you know, I, I can see what you do in a sort of the XTC sort of template comes into mind of guitar playing, and it's it never to me seemed like it would work in Duran Duran. But I've watched you do it. That's a very polished music, Duran and Spandau. Oh, and all, you know, we come from that kind of world. That, but that's where... actually, yeah, that's sorry if I can interject. Because that's something that intrigued me. Because it always struck me that all you lot in the early 90s, I mean, in no way as visceral as, say, punk was. But it did seem that part of that whole wave was a rejection of the polish of the 80s, of the kind of poshness yeah. of pop music. So you, were, it's like you were sort of, even though you were technically very adept and adventurous, but it was still, it was still... The antithesis of what Duran and Spandau were. Well, it was. It, I mean, I don't know how much I'm allowed to say. Um, the, the the eighties was different drugs. Well, well, kind of. I don't. I don't know. Different, but very. I mean, it was. It was. It was a sort of. Um, it was an aspirational music. It was really uh, glamorous, and the videos would reflect yeah. that. And 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 it was extremely beautiful, young men being sexy, you know, and having the agency as young men, knowing that they're sexy and not being afraid to be sexy. Um, that was different in the early 90s because the early 90s and Britpop came out of a sort of thing of 80s indie, indie music really, where, you know, yeah, if you yeah. played three, three, three notes in a row that were in the blues scale, you'd be like hung, you know? So um, it, it's a very, very different, different outlook. And the whole thing of selling out and the whole thing of having that, I mean, it was a, a, a lot more of a withdrawn, shy, smoldering sort, yeah. of, sort of thing. And almost kind of like more, more of a, of a sixties influence thing sonically, I suppose. And, well, massive Sid Barrett. Yeah, I mean, but it sort of moved from a sort of a 60s thing into a sort of a wire thing, into a post-punk thing where everything seemed to be able to get used. 
I mean, and 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 not long after that, of course, that it 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 kind of there was a lot of eighties throwback stuff, but still less polished, still a little more um, ramshackle. Um, I mean, we thought, and you know, Stephen Street um, produced a lot of that stuff, um, and we we you know, who was producing in the eighties, of course. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. It was it was it was kind of different. It, it wasn't as aspirational in the glamorous way. It was more like we, our obsession with a sort of a Mike Lee element. It was yeah, of, and I suppose Mad Madchester kind of led the way slightly mm. in boys boys doing that, you know. And and and, and, and that that's why I, I mean it is extraordinary given that you know that you were part of that dialectic that you you popped up in duran duran how did how did it happen well, before it, we go it, back it and talk odd. about it, it makes weird sense well i was on a panel um for sonos speakers i think and uh, there was a small panel talking about david bowie again this is just not long after he died and we were talking about our favorite song of his and, and it was a sort of a little event with miranda sawyer and other and nick rhodes among other people was on the um panel and he said do you know <laughs> <laughs> Duran are going to be in the studio and it would be fun for you to join us. And, you know, and I thought, fun. It might, yeah, actually, what a weird thing, but it might it might be fun. It'd be very surreal, but yeah, it might be fun. And not thinking I'd hear hear um, about it again. And then and then a couple of years later, my friend Errol Alken, who makes music and producers and DJs of course, and, and all the rest of it, lives up the road. He says, you know what? I've just had an interview with Duran Duran. They, they're, they're thinking of making me a producer, and then your name came up. I was like, oh my gosh! This, um, Nick must have mentioned me. But the thing is, I, I, I think that when we started work on it, of course, you're in the graft. You know, you're in the, you're, you're focusing on, you know, making your way through melodies and chords and drum beats and things like that. So you're not hearing the finished, polished. Um, thing that people are going to hear when it's released. So you're in amongst the sort of um, the making of it, the graft of it. And, and 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 my sort of idea, and I suppose Errol Alkin's idea as well, was was to sort of try to take it back to, to um, at least with my job, to take it back to sort of post-punk and to make weird, mm. to, to try and get weirdo disco things. So I, I was getting... A lot well, you of think we, we were all post-punk in many ways. Yeah. I mean, that's what we I were mean, doing. I mean, we sort of art, 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 post-punk art groups, yeah. yeah. But I think you came in as a kind of Adrian Ballou sort of, uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> like, oh, you know, well, you know uh, sort of... Ballou was uh, the guitarist who... Um, who Bowie used for all the Berlin stuff. Oh, right, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Nick, Sorry, Nick, I'm, I'm terribly ignorant. Yeah, yeah. Or, or exactly. a kind of Robert... Or the sort of Robert Fripp coming in to yeah. do stuff with Bowie as yeah. well. I, I like your kind of yeah. thoughtful, abstract sa- sound effect qualities that you added to. It seemed per- it seems perfect in the mix. Well, the thing is, I I I I'm often got gotten in to do what Graham Coxon does, but I don't always like what people know me for. You know, uh, I suppose people might get me in thinking that I'm going to make loads of crazy noise over things and and um yeah that's kind of half the story with me but uh, but um um I do like to create things that are, are are beautiful and um as well so so there are things within the Duran Duran songs that people might not think of guitars but are and that would have inspired Nick to create lead lines around um, on keyboards and things like that and, and and Simon told me that a lot of what I was doing was was really inspiring his his lines with his vocals and things like that but I was really um I was really surprised pleasantly surprised by how they work we were sitting around on sofas um with an electric drum kit all together and writing they explored every flipping avenue possible what this chord if it goes to there and what about if it goes to there the melody goes to there and then i come back what about that way i mean i mean it was like oh my god because i i'm kind of a bit quick and a little bit slapdash but they really i was like wow what if that's a minor what if that's a major and they really do explore every bit of bit of potential yeah potential um sonic boulevard you know they and so, um, it was it, <laughs> that's the title of my next album how dare you <laughs> oh, sorry <mate>. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Sonic Boulevard, um, you can edit that out, you know, um, <laughs> no, musical, <laughs> musical highway, down, you know. I'm joking. Down the old, down um, the old road. You must have given them new blood. I mean, no, honestly, I, I would have been enthusiastic. Literally. 
<laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It yeah. was. I mean, it was interesting, and actually, it wasn't a lot different to how we made thirteen and things like that with Blur. And I sort of thought, well, you know, Simon would sit there for a bit listening to the chord sequences, and um, yeah, and suddenly you get a line, and um, it's like, oh my, right, Simon's getting something here. He's get, he's getting a chorus, or he's getting something, and that sounds good. And then there'd be a. <laughs> You know, a Jaran Jaran drum fill. It's like, oh my bloody hell, this is Jaran Jaran. And 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 it was and it was just a couple of elements it took to kick in. And it's like, whoa, this is Jaran Jaran. And that's when it got surreal because it wasn't just some blokes um grafting through some chord sequences and suddenly yeah. proper famous band. Yeah. And and um and that would make my hairs go up a little bit. You picked but, yourself on a yacht immediately. Well, yeah, that was not yeah. But, uh, I, I feel slightly swindled. <laughs> you've uh, it's a shame you've joined them at their humble period <laughs> yeah i know well, <laughs> yeah well you know their humble period is still like much better than my top my top period yeah 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 but, you know yeah, did, yeah, Graham, is we, that is that something that's going to go on would you i mean would you because you've been um, playing with them well played. i did do a radio two gig with them at the, yeah. the theater up there and that was fun i watched that, that yeah was good. And, have you put don is don brown's nose been put out is did he mind oh, he was, don he was mind? really lovely actually and we sort of shared the parts and Good. um, you know, had a little look at each other's guitars and stuff like that. And um, you know, if they want me to do anything, I'll, I'll gladly do it. You know, it, it's kind of fab. It, 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 it's fun. It's it's fun to sort of stand back there, not have any sort of vocal things to do, and just concentrate on playing the guitar. And you're a southerner at last. Someone they've got some southerner. I'm a from southerner. The south in. In but you know, let's I talk get about those days. So... Like ordinary world or something. It's like. Yeah, that yeah, chord yeah. sequence is flipping lovely. Oh no, it's amazing! It's brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. That's like, Warren, though. Isn't it? That's Warren, isn't it? Warren Kuchera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and yeah. but but a lovely chord sequence to play. Oh, it's a beautiful chord mm. sequence. Fun enough, Gary and I played it together with Simon Le Bon at a wedding. But of course, because it was Duran, Gary wouldn't learn the chords. <laughs> oh really? <laughs> well, it's quite uh, funny. We did, and Nick Mason. Nick Nick Mason was playing drums. And of course, what was brilliant with Nick playing it, it just got floided immediately. Oh, wow. It just became kind of com it became comfortably numb. You know, it was fantastic. It did. Oh wow, yeah. that sounds good. Did. I think uh, did you record you should have recorded it if you didn't. I don't think it's, it's probably on a few phones. I think Yeah, but the pol the police took them away, I think. Um, yeah. But let's talk about your early life growing up and music and how what first turned you on and, and was music in your house, Graham? Um yeah, yeah, because I'm I'm surprised I'm I'm sort of the Beatles. I mean, I was born when the Beatles were still around, so just. So um, my dad would have Abbey Road parties all the time where they just wow. play Abbey Road again and again and again and again. Um, so the Beatles, as far as, as as soon as I could put records on a thing, I was playing the Beatles albums. Because you were born in Germany, weren't you? I was born in Germany. I lived in, was it Minden? Was your dad in the army then? Yeah, he was. I was born in a sort of military hospital up there, um, and lived in Berlin for a bit. So I beat, I beat. I think I beat David Bowie. Yeah. <laughs> Just. And, um, but then, but then grew up in Colchester. But yeah, music or the, the sort of military band. My dad was a bandsman. He 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 was a sort of uh, he he was a glue tube. That's uh, right. He, yeah. He, what what did he play? Glue tube, clarinet. Or the licorice. You're quite similar to Pete Townsend in that respect, aren't you? His his dad was his dad was a sax player in the sax player in the RAF. Yeah, so sort of sort of a similarity. Um, so, but but um, yeah, I mean, I had I, I learned how to work a record player very early, so I was listening to music and going through their forty fives and and the, the, the albums, which was which was a lot of Beatles. I could always hear the, you know, in what, certainly what Oasis were doing, but certainly yeah. I could hear that British music of the 60s in what you guys were doing in the 90s. I think, because I'm I'm slightly older than you, when I, when, when I bought my first record, my, my parents certainly didn't have the Beatles in the house. You know, they were pre-Beatles, pre-rock and roll generation. And when I bought my first record, the Beatles had split up. So I never bought a Beatles record. Yeah. I was just, to me, it was like, you just keep looking forward. You just buy whatever's come out. I bought Wings, you know, and John Lennon, but that was it. And, but I think you're, it's interesting. Your inspiration came from the stuff before mine. 
yeah, yeah, that's and, odd. And that filtered into what you guys did in the night. Yeah, and that, that it is odd. It did. It, it, it was well. There was no other way of getting any music, you know. And and by the time I was aware of music in the late seventies, it was chant music, and it was the late seventies, which was full of great stuff from what Rainbow, the Buzzcocks, <coughs> Chic, and all sorts of other crazy. Stuff. You yeah. know, I mean, yeah, it yeah, was yeah. the Jam, David Bowie. Loads of people were doing amazing stuff like 78, 79 when I was like seven or eight or nine and then into the 80s with, like, you know, I was a big jam fan, you know, and, and, and the Smiths and then some of the other more alternative -y sort of things in the 80s. So um, that I, I was kind of I was kind of lucky. I mean, I, I loved music and I loved listening to it. So a lot gets just stored away doesn't it really when 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 you love listening to something it's almost like you're 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 practicing by listening to music it is informing you about how chords work about how lead lines go and and, and, and how singing goes and, and and things like that so but for you certainly yeah i don't that's not that's, that's everything because yeah so when did the guitar come in well i i always had a little drum kit and then when i was 11 i started playing the saxophone properly at school but um, yeah, I mean, it was lovely stuff. It was like Pavan by Maurice Ravel and stuff like that. But the guitar, come on, the guitar, Graham. Well, the guitar happened because I was sitting around doing nothing and my dad's mother was around. I thought, well, I'll get my, my sister's old guitar out and try and play a couple of chords so I can be doing something, you know, like some lute player, you know, uh, <laughs> I sort of imagined it to be. Um, my sister had all of these chord boxes on cards within in the case of the guitar. So I just looked through them and just do it. I didn't even really know how to tune it. And it was probably never in tune. And I couldn't just go on YouTube and go, how do you tune a guitar? There was no pitch yeah. pipes or anything like that. I, I didn't know what I was doing. And, and every now and then I'd send off, save up the money and send off for a songbook, like a Who's Greatest Hits songbook that would have the chord boxes above the lyrics. Oh, and yeah, the box, the chord, box. The chord boxes. and and some jam ones, you know, and, and I'd sort of just start, and I'd just have to work it out by ear, everything. I couldn't go, there was no YouTube, I didn't have a teacher, I just worked it out. Did you have, because this was, because I was learning clarinet at school and I was learning this classical music, but then I fell in love with sort of rock and roll as a separate thing. Mm. And then I had, and I got, had a bass and, cause I, and then I was learning that. But to me, the music I was learning and the clarinet was a completely separate thing. It's like, it might as well have been a different subject. Yeah. Did you find that or was it all one thing for you? No, like it, it still is that? different, actually. Yeah. Um, with with saxophone, I mean, I, I do like, I mean, I've played it within pop music and I've done more of that um, sort of recently on, on some on some some a recent project. But but really that was a sort of a world of jazz and Jackie McLean and John Coltrane and all of that, the saxophone. But I never really went into jazz guitar. The guitar was always 60s and thank all god that. and all of those little shapes was just bewildering to me but the saxophone for me was the jazz world and the guitar for me was rock and pop etc world i love your guitar playing yeah. graham and, and i remember when i very first heard it and i was you know listening to your second album and, and park life and and I was so envious of what you did because it just seemed like no one else would have thought of that. I don't know any other guitar player who would have thought of playing there, of stopping there, of grabbing that chord, making that slide. You know, it it was a, a unique style. And I, I suppose Andy Partridge from XTC had, I could hear that as an influence. I could certainly now, you mention it here a bit of Weller, but it was... There was so much personality in what you did yeah. and bravery. You didn't care if there was a slight distuning even on a track. No, um, yeah, um, and there's, I mean, and Andy Partridge, I've worked with him once and, and he's phenomenally kind of, um, I mean, my, 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 my lack of technical skill forced me in, in, in other directions, really. And, and because I'd listened to a lot of proggy stuff growing up, a lot of early Floyd and a lot of... Exactly what I want to bring up, which is that 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 Sid period Floyd is so apparent, which is that thing of of using the guitar to do things that aren't necessarily guitar things, like yeah. not the thing it says on the box that it. Could yeah, play. I mean, I did that quite a lot, and I and I used to try and make it sound like Sims, and and Robert Fripp was a huge influence as well, and My Bloody Valentine, and and things like that. So the guitar for me was was a way of making sound. It wasn't like I mean, I I love John Mayall. 
blues break and I love blues music as well, but I was never just going to be a, a, like a blues guitarist or anything like that. But I like the idea of the guitar having its own will and perhaps the guitar is going to decide on its own that it's going to do something without my will being imposed on it. And so if you stick an echo, a delay pedal on and a couple of distortion units at the same time and just bang it and put your finger somewhere, then you're not quite sure, you know, it, it's sort of, it can make a sound that inspires your next move. You know, it's not all up to you. And, and, and I suppose that's what I've always liked about guitar. It doesn't always work. Sometimes, you know, it's just brilliant. And other times you just do some of the, the bad bum names. But, uh... And Stephen Street has always allowed you He's never tried to tidy that up because there would be a temptation with a lot of producers to say, well, let's get this how it should be. Let's get this right. Yeah, well, he was always, sometimes I'd have to play something that was precise. Like there's a song called Best Days where it's, there's a lot of double stopping and things like that. And it had to be right. I mean, that's the difference between me with, with, with wanting to create a sort of a sonic chaos almost a sort of an ex, sort of abstract expressionist thing and then there's also a different side to me that that loves a bit of Chopin or something like that and that and 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 that um it has to be right or it has to um sort of um it has to has to be a bit like that double stopping that George Harrison did, which was an influence from the 50s, which was so I mean there's a lot of in my playing um checking out or using 50s stuff and, and then right. dragging it through psychedelia and all the rest of it and punk rock and prog rock to where we are now. I think I think I sort of like dragging an old Christmas tree. It's distilled. Beetle Bum, for instance, that's the timing of that riff, just with that slide. It's one of those songs where you, you've perfected that trick where no matter how many times you hear that song, you can never tell where one is when it comes well, in. I really like stuff like that. Well, Damon yeah, often, yeah, no, same here. I like, Damon would often come in wrong and I'd have to adjust my <laughs> riff, which was actually more difficult to get it. If he's come in wrong, then I have to think, oh, hang on, hang on. Where do I, I have to change it. Uh, <laughs> he was your Keith Richards. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it can be, that, that can be tricky. It didn't happen very often. But when... <clears throat> you mentioned, you mentioned, you compared your guitar to, 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 I think you said French Impressionism a minute ago. Let's let's just talk Abstract about the fact you were an art student. Abstract well, and Expressionism. Our painter, Thank our, you. A fully functioning painter. Very you were you were goldsmiths painter. at the same time as that whole yeah. uh, you know the Brit Damien movement. and Landy. I was um, I was uh, a, Sam Taylor would. Yeah, they were. I think Sam was a second year. Damien Hurst was a third year, and uh, all of those, all of those guys. Yeah. Because I, I made well, a, um, I made a documentary for for TV a few years ago about that scene and about how um, they were sort of the first generation to come out of art school, working class kids coming out of art school and and to go into art, you know, they actually chose art as a as their profession and they made it rock and roll and you were kind of you act you went into music but there was a tie up there was a sense of people hanging out with each other and was it. Was it was it difficult for you to make the choice between oh, I want to be an artist or I want to be a musician? Not really. I mean, as Blur's second ever gig was at that degree show, Damien Hirst's year's degree show at Goldsmiths. But it, 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 it became obvious that music was my, my sort of first love and I was really comfortable with what I was doing with a guitar and within the, 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 the sort of frameworks of songs and things like that. But with, with, with painting, really what happened or drawing or any kind of like visual expression of my own that was really to do with a sort of um i uh, a thera therapeutic thing really it, it, i was never going to say all oh, right this is going to be my c c career i didn't i didn't ever think of it in those in those terms it was something that i did from a kid to understand the world how i felt and and mm. and, and music was how i sort of um, ascertained the world to feel. That's how I got what the world felt through what they were saying in songs. And I expressed myself with pencils and, 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 and stuff like that. So um, although I've had art on covers of albums and things like that, it was never really a thing that I thought that it was gonna be, I was gonna be uh, making a career out of it. It's just always been a little bit too personal that's interesting because it's ironic because you did one Blur album cover, didn't you? And I did one of them, yeah. 
Yeah. And then I did a couple of singles. And then I yeah. did artworks for artwork for other people on their albums a little bit. And um and I've had it some of your own things like that. But, I know, and you, you have a lovely site with prints. And yeah, everything. but the thing is, a lot of my stuff is well, it's yeah. not exactly what you want on your wall, you know. It's um, it's a bit well, <laughs> weird or, you know, a bit too... I mean, I, I tried to put some on my... Actually, there's one up there, but I wouldn't put it out in the front room. You know, it's people come around and they're like, oh, my God, what's that? It's too revealing. <laughs> because it's, because oh. it's more about my feelings, I'm not, you know, it's not... Therapy. Yeah, it's kind of it's like it's a, it's more like a, a diary, or, you know, rather than anything else. And but also you... the great difference between a visual artist and a musical artist is that you write a song and you've written a song. You don't have to give it away, you know, in, in order to monetize or I don't know, you know, to make it a statement. It's like with a painting, you sell it. With a song, in theory, you sell it, but it's just there. It's just out in the world. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it it it, it is it is odd. I mean, so the whole idea of selling paintings, although. I, I think that's okay. It, it it seems a bit odd to me. I might have to do it one day. Who knows? But um, <laughs> well, no. I, I mean, I, I I know a lot of I know a lot of those artists who came out of that period, you know, and I watched them a lot. I, you know, I was sort of hanging out on the scene a bit in the early nineties, and. You don't have to court your listener. You don't have to go out and find the people who are buying your records and have dinner with them. And no they don't have to be. They don't have to be rich. You know, no matter yeah, exactly. it, yeah. it, it, that whole scene is so. Sp Listen, I just want to talk about whether or not you saw yourself growing up as maybe the one who would sing your songs, or whether you always saw yourself as the side man next to a lead singer in that more conventional way. And 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 when you did you go hunting for someone like Damien to come into your life, Damien? I didn't really have any choice. Um, I was sort of. I, I met Damon when I was 12 or 13. So I just, I'd only just started picking up a guitar and I was playing other people's things. So I didn't have my music and I didn't have my songs. Um, Damon approached me one day and I was the only person in the school that played sax. So he said, you play sax, don't you? I've got this song. We're going to record it on a four track, come along and we'll do it. And um, so I was always, Damon was writing songs, you know, and I would do what I, so I, I was kind of instant side man, but it wasn't anything that, that I gave much thought to. There was no plan for me. And Damon and I just stuck together and we, we made a sort of a little promise, like if I make it, I'll, in, in, I'll, I'll involve you. And if you make it, you involve me. And that was, that was it really. Um, but Dave was someone I'd been playing around in Colchester bands with, and Alex was someone who I was living above in the halls of residence when I moved to Camberwell to go to Goldsmiths College. So um, those other people came into my life, and I sort of said, oh, I've just met a bass player, Damon. Should we give him a go? He's, he's, he's all right, nice looking and all that. You know? And then and, and Dave had been involved with us a little bit to a certain extent anyway before... Alex joined, so 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 you know I played with in Colchester bands with Dave. Um, there was quite a big scene. Oh, so, so, so you were in other bands. So it wasn't like it was literally the first people you came across that came Seymour, and then yeah, I mean the Colchester bands were were just mad mad bands. I, I, I was drafted in to do sax on something on an improvisational bands that were really into things like Gong and Van de Graaff Generator. So, so I'd be improvising saxophone all afternoon in the Colchester Arts Centre while people had carrot cake and all the rest of it. And um, and then there was other bands like Hazel Dean and the Carp Enters from Hell, which were a band that did loads of silly daft songs. And they were sort of like a punk song, punk band, really. And then Schrodinger's Cat, I think I drummed for. for no, there was a band called Schrodinger's Cat. Well, there was briefly. I can't no, because I, 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 this is a gag I've had for years. I've, because I, I always thought that I couldn't believe that there, there's never been a prog band called Schrodinger's Cat. Because, uh, because the people say, "Are you still playing with Schrodinger's Cat?" Yes and no. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> well, that was a bit like my thing. They, that was what they'd asked me. I said, "Well, I don't know." Yeah. I did that yeah. gig, and they haven't. That was it. Was 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 there a sense at the beginning of of the 
of your time with Blur that there was a scene, that there was something to latch onto. You know, I mean, when we started, you know, obviously we were coming after punk, but there was a definite sense of, you know, when we walked into those various clubs in London uh, in the late 70s, that there was the beginning of a new scene happening and we had to be the house band, as it were. Was there something going on? What was going on in London? I was just in the band at the time, trying to make the best music we could. Yeah. And for me, it was very 60s influenced, or it was My Bloody Valentine yeah. influenced, or it was kind of a little bit Jesus and Mary Chain influenced, or it was like Velvet Underground. I mean, if you look at all those yeah. bands, basically they come out of like the Velvet Underground with how they look. Yeah. You know, it's not a baggy haircut. It's a Sterling Morrison haircut. Yeah. It's a John Cale yeah. haircut. Yeah. It's a leather jacket, stripy T-shirt, winkle pickers, tight black jeans it's like Andy Warhol dressed like that you know it's a sort of actual, well, it, it, it came aesthetic out aesthetic that was dragged through the 80s by a yeah. lot of the indie bands and um and and it became the sort of uniform but yeah and there's no other way I mean da- Damon's fringe was down his nose yeah. at that point and they had to sort of cut this window out so he so we could see his eyes <laughs> when well, it, it came out the sort of be- beatnik a- a- a french existentialists yeah. when and that which when the beatles went to hamburg that's that was the sort of aspiration when she cut their hair yeah it's, yeah. A, it's an extremely cool aesthetic you know the velvet underground you were cool as looking back yeah ever. But also because yeah, musically, there's no other way. I mean, and Damon's sort of said this to me. It's much, it's, it's, it's such, I mean, even lyrically, it's such a tip of the hat to see Emily play. Yeah. Isn't it? There's so much Sid going on there. But that, yeah, and that's that's kind of bang. Yeah. You know, it's got a drum loop underneath the real drum. Great riff. And it's got well, a sort of a riff. Hammondy two-note lick, you know, and it's got that sort of, it's it- got a woozy sort of riff over it. So. Did it annoy you then, being part of all of that? you know, the battle of Britpop and all of that stuff that was going on at the time with Country House. and um... It was kind of annoying because I didn't, I wasn't that interested in it. And a lot of the skullduggery going on was with, I, was, I had no knowledge of really. And, and to have had a, a good old, you know, to have an, a, a, a normal number one would have been, would have been kind of nice. So we had a few number ones, I think, but, um, I found it a bit, yeah, a bit stressful, did. you know. And when you when you yeah. sign your your your, I mean, it was kind of an extraordinary thing that happened. Didn't you? Well, it was the first time that a battle of the like, as opposed yeah. to said, look, you know, Beatles, Stones, spanned out around. It was the first time anything like that made the front page of the tabloids. Yeah, you know, it was, <laughs> and, and it was really a lot to do with the tabloids and to do with the press and 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 there were and, and people behind the scenes who. I mean, there was somebody who worked around Oasis and somebody who worked around Blur that would make sure that our releases staggered yeah. so we wouldn't step on each other's toes. I mean, that was going on behind behind the scenes. It's almost like Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy or World War Two. You know, that <laughs> there is stuff going on. You know, people are communicating. Not that not that we knew that, but but at one point they were like, "Damn it, why have we? Gosh, this is a bit too close." Well, we just. Damn it, we're, we're, we seem to be releasing something on the same day. And I don't know whether it was Damon who said, yeah, I want to go release on the same day or whether it was some, something else. I know it's always said that Damon decided to actually did the, made the decision in the end to, to release on the same day. But, yeah, whatever. The back channel thing, I love the idea that, it, that there's a sort of red phone for Blur and Oasis to speak to each other. Yeah. <laughs> it, it was definitely somebody who worked... There was definitely two mates who were, and we they both worked for each band. It seems to me that that the one. It seems to me that the, one of the big differences between you two is is something that Oasis Oasis were representing a cultural movement. It certainly centered around the north of England, but but it was it was really more of a a statement about personality and and and, and culture, youth culture. But what you were doing was musical it was you it was much more about the music and i appreciated that in a, in a, in a, a lot more rather than the anthem if you like yeah and and the detail yeah I, and also, well, also the, the fact humor. that it was moving oasis got this blueprint and it was brilliant and it was this perfect stadium thing and so that's what they did and they so kept doing yeah that. i mean they, they did every, write, every they blur wrote album every blur album was going somewhere. and they wrote songs they still wrote love songs and about girls and this and that it was, it's, it's, it's no but i mean sonically it was yeah. like there was that thing and it was this machine and that's what it did whereas your album was you know everyone was every next blur album was a risk was a but we were trying stuff out more than oasis maybe yeah. oasis did get stuck in the 
in a kind of a Beatles palette with heavy guitars and and you know and big cello things and and and, and the rest of it. But but that was it, it works, you know. And I like Oasis far more now than than I than I did then. And I can completely understand why we were in competition because we were all young men um, and our careers were at stake. It was a matter of flipping life or death, really. So I can understand that passions got high. But um, yeah, a few things that were said were a little bit a bit much. But um, <laughs> yeah, we, we were always trying yeah. things out because we, 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 we felt us that we weren't limited and we weren't afraid to make something that was completely uncool, like faux free jazz B-sides and, 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 and um, let's all go down the strand and all of that malarkey. But it, it seemed at that point that everybody was saying, yeah, this is our revolver. We've just made our revolver. And it's like, well, why would you want to make the revolver that we've had for years is still sounding pretty good. I don't, you know, I don't really want another revolver, but there was a lot of obsession with the, with the Beatles that got a little bit much. Yeah. If you follow your guitar, listening to your guitar style from the early blur stuff, and even on park life, there then is this, and the great escape, uh, certainly, but there then is this kind of boiling down to an even more simpler style that, that I mean, I never forget when you know song two. I first heard it, and it was like, "That's your riff, isn't it?" Yeah. You were going out of your way to to, to peel aside all the stuff you didn't need, and to get down to the essence of what could make a great tune, a great song, a guitar part. I kind of was because before that, there would be about six guitars on it, and 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 it and instead of making it louder, it it reduced the presence of all of the guitars and everything and made everything too hard to mix, made the drums sound over compressed and all the rest of it. So I began to realize that less guitars was going to give more space for other instruments and every, all it, all of the instruments are going to have more poke because I, I like drums to sound, but I'm a bit of an obsessive with, with drums. So I was trying to do the job of six guitars with one guitar. I suppose that's what I started to do in the end. And, um, and, and with song two, it was sort of, that Damon had that chord sings like that, but I was listening to a lot of kind of at that point I was sort of listening to Steve Malkmus and 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 um, Slanted and Enchanted and there was a sort of um, a, a sort of a an, an almost sort of slovenly way of playing. I wanted it. I mean it it. An over an over swing of playing almost and and sort of so I, I was it was it's almost as like a perfectionism and that it, it, it's kind of played badly but in the most but in the most well way I could um, yeah. and it was the idea of it being a, a skinny horrible little crap guitar sound and then going <clears throat> and then going into a, a yeah. huge. Thing. And we did it as a joke, just so that the record company would go, oh, God, you, what are you doing? You know, but um, they, they absolutely loved it and said this should be a single. And right, OK, great. I mean, the god, the god of that guitar style, in a way, and I mean, the epitome of it is is the is the guitar solo on on, on Buzzcock's boredom, isn't it, really? It's... Yeah. How, what's that one? Is that the same as? Well, it's guitar. just a one note guitar solo. Who was Pete Shelley? Who was the guitar? Who's the guitar player? Is that Diggle? Diggle. Steve Diggle. Yeah, but I, I saw that old um, "What Do I Get" um, Buzzcocks on, on yeah. the old Tony Wilson program when he says "tricky guitar solo" and dong 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 dong, and he just you know. And but I, I the thing is, I think really more about about Blur is that we we were pretty intelligent. I'm not saying Blur, um, Oasis weren't. But we were um, intelligent enough to to sort of include, you know, to know the, the sort of absurdity of it all, really, and not to be afraid to really the music. I mean, I, you know, the, the, the you guitar solo in country the house is 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 awful. You know, it's meant to be awful. It's meant to be, uh, you know, like an idiot playing. Um, and wasn't it you? You said you'd only do a character in that video because you weren't happy. Yeah, because I, 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 I it was all a bit Benny Hill, wasn't it? Women and sexist, yeah. Yeah. Makes you feel wonderfully bland. And then uh, Joe Guest is, you know, and it purposefully edits to Joe Guest just looking like she doesn't know what's going on. Um, so it's a, it's all right. 
Yeah, but what I said, one thing I don't know if you get the credit for, because uh, Charles, you know, because I used to come see you all the time, is that you were a blower, a fantastic live band. Mm. Really, really good live. We tried, we tried really hard to be. It was important to us. Um, yeah. And we played as hard as we could, you know, and um, we were seriously exhausted, you know, what it's like when you, when you play live, it's, it's physically and emotionally very draining, and particularly when you have to be approaching two hour sets and the sort of intensity that, that you have to get to. Because uh, when, you, when you're when you making records and you're the hippest thing and you're, it, the, you know, they're all so in the moment and they're, they're fresh meat. And then you had that, you had that hi hiatus and you came back to Blur and you were then the big live band going out playing old tunes. Yeah. There, did that... Does that feel grand or does, did that feel uncomfortable? Because I've been in that situation, you know, you do the greatest hits tour, as it were. Um, How did it feel for it you? Was, it was great because it, I played them in a completely different way. I, I I didn't feel forced to play them. I felt we were playing them. I felt grateful. Proud. I felt more grateful for the situation. And and PAs had come on a long time, a long way. I mean, <laughs> hell's bells, you know. The PAs were as big as a laptop for Glastonbury, you know, these tiny speakers. And there was all this space at the side of the stage where before there'd be these huge boxes all strapped, strapped onto the side <laughs> of the stage. So yeah. you could hear yourself yeah. clearly. It was a less of a struggle in that way. Um, the, the the audiences were huge and happy. And um, I thought, well, this is a flipping good job, you know. Um, I'm playing a lovely guitar through a Marshall that's cranked right up. And I'm singing and I can hear myself. And yeah, it's great. And, I, and it, it became, I became a little more grateful for what we'd always had. I reckon a lot of bands would get that if they had that chance to do it again. You know, that's, and, and, and it's why I sort of get, I almost get annoyed with, with, with other bands that have been squabbling and, and not really got, got it, got it together to sort of have another go because I, I, I think it's almost, it's kind of sad to, 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 to hang on to, to resentments, you know, as a sober person, obviously. I, yeah. I think it's, uh, yeah. it's, it's important not to hang on to resentments. And so I was really, really grateful that Damon and I had that chat over an Eccles cake or whatever it was that, that time. And we decided that, you know, why haven't we really been talking? I've no idea. I've forgotten. So oh, let's just get on with it, shall we? Let's have a go. Yeah, great. And um, 2009, we were doing that that Glastonbury, and it was like, oh, yeah. oh my god, you know, what, this is this is incredible. And you, but you've got, you've now got so much stuff on your own that, that it's just like the blur is in the rearview mirror for you. So that gives it. It must be a nice having that detached. <laughs> really to come back and play it easily. <laughs> Alex, yeah, Alex James is in the passenger seat, to... prodding me all the time. They're not in the <laughs> room at all. Um, no, no, they're all sitting in the car with me, you know, still. <laughs> so should we do some more? It's like, what do you reckon, Damon? It's like, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, shall we? I mean, yeah, well, well we're not doing anything, shall we? Yeah, yeah, all right, all right. And then we drive <laughs> drive on another own year and you know, we're still here, are we? Um, it's kind of like that. And then other thing, you know, I, I, I'll get out of the car and, and, and go to a service station and do something else, you know, for a bit. And I'll drop Damon off and he'll do that. You're brilliant at picking up an analogy. I know, I'm glad with it. You certainly ran with that. Exactly. It's <laughs> but Graham, Graham, I, the trouble is, is, well, it's not the trouble, but this is what happens, is you go off and you start to, to have a different process of making music, something that you're 100% in charge of. And obviously... Damon's doing the same with his stuff and, and Alex has got his scene. And when you come together, it's hard to to sip get to get back into the way you used to work. And it's finding that magic again where you can both ag all agree with each yeah, other. Yeah, well it's impossible to do project. do it the same. Yeah, you because know, Damon as well has, has has had a studio for years and works in a certain way. Um and he would make decisions that maybe I don't agree with, with 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 music but there's no point in me having an argument with him about it you know i accept the fact that actually that that i'm disagreeing with it but um am i right maybe i'm not right it's not up to me to be a con control freakish about 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 anything and uh, um so it's, it's being you know accepting of other people's ways and and for the sake of of um, everything feeling good um, you know, obviously, if so, I think someone is making a really big mistake, and it's not just a silly little mistake, I'll, I'll, I'll push the point a little bit to, and and, and um, see if they really, really mean it, and if they've thought it through. But um, but but mostly, I don't really 
have much of a tr- other, um, problem. But we, because with the Magic Whip, that album, Stephen Street and I got that together over a month out of old uh, old jam sessions that that we, done, and really? we made songs out of that wow, together, right. and I constructed them and came up with alternative. You know, if there was a melody line, I'd come up with an alternative chord. So that, you led that that would fit the melody line, or because a lot of them were just one chord sequence or one chord. So we created songs out of them all, and they took them to Damon and said, "What do you reckon?" And Damon then decided, "Yeah, I'll, I'll work on this too." Because you you have a brand. And people are excited when they, when they, they, they know that the these individuals that they've grown to love are coming together to agree on a piece of of, of musical art, yeah. and, and and that's exciting for you. That's that you'll always have that if you can get in the same room. Absolutely, I I actually think that that Blur will always be capable of that. You know, when the time comes around and and, and we're all the stars are aligning and we're into the idea, I think we'll always be kind of capable of, of doing something interesting it doesn't mean everyone will like it but it'll be interesting but, and, and it'll be something that we would we will want to do and feel the need to do but there's no point in yeah. doing it if you don't really feel the need to do it or if it's a good idea guy i can see that clock on the on the wall in graham's studio Gra- Gra- actually kept it's a very for, nice oh, clock that i've been admiring We've kept him for well over an hour. Can you hear the yeah. clip? Oh, I just wanted to ask. I've got the gain uh, high enough on this microphone for you to hear the clip. <laughs> uh, so what's that? What? Where, where do you go now, Graham? Where do I go now? Well, what, what's I'm that? mucking about to with the the stage toilet. three and Nord stage three is driving me bonkers. Um, you know, I, I've, I've, um, there, there's, there's something wonderful coming up this week. Well, this week, oh, this year, this, this spring, which I've been working on all. all last year a, a, a new collaboration a new thing wow so there's something oh. lovely coming up graham it's been a real pleasure talking to you yeah, sorry we're all talking you're... all over each other aren't we we're all like <laughs> i saw you graham at the um at the get back oh, yeah. after party and i i got all shy why it's really funny i couldn't i don't know that's, that's what happens when you get sober, isn't it? You suddenly realise that you're a no, shy. No, I was shy. I, I, had to go, I, had, <laughs> I, I had to go up to Glyn John and tell him he was the most beautiful man in the documentary. Wasn't he? Wasn't he? We, we, guy, we were all at that screening yep. together. We were all, that there, was we're all there. Phenomenal, wasn't it? Yes. I mean, what an experience lovely, yeah. to see that. I don't think I've grinned so much in years. Just, I mean, just oh, what the shoes. Shoes. He came into rehearsals the next day wearing the nearest thing he could find to McCartney's brown shoes. He's talking about me. He's talking oh, yeah, about yeah. I, I've got a pair that <laughs> nearly. <laughs> Graham, lovely to talk you to you. Do. And do we, will, we will come up and say hello if we ever see you looking lost and shy in a bar. Yeah, do so. Yes. I come see the sources. I'd love to. I mean, like I don't it. know why yeah, I'm we... in heaven. I'd love to. Graham Brilliant. Coxon is such a nice guy, isn't he? He's such a lovely man and brilliant. Anyway, <laughs> thank you so much for listening. And uh, we, we, we love doing this. So always leave comments. Always tell us what you who any ideas of people you'd like us to try and get yeah, on the show as well would be fantastic. But, but not sort of just your mate. Yeah. Or some <laughs> some side man that that is so obscure yeah. that you're the only person who's ever heard of him. Exactly. We, and we say that with love. So uh, it's good night from me. And it's good night from all of us. 